It's my pleasure to welcome Jack and Draca. Uh, you may have seen Jack's exuberant acceptance of the grand prize at the 2012 Intel International Science and Engineering Fair, his subsequent TED Talks, or the many pieces of media coverage, including 60 Minutes a couple of weeks ago and tomorrow night's edition of the Colbert Report. <laughs> if so, you know that Jack, at the age of 14, conceived of an application to use carbon nanotubes for a relatively simple paper-based blood test that could enable early detection of pancreatic cancer. Just one of 200 researchers responded to Jack's request for lab support, and months of intensive work in a Johns Hopkins laboratory yielded the results that secured the Intel Prize. I'd like to ask Jack to come to the podium to share the story of this journey and his thoughts on the creative nature of scientific discovery. Jack. So my story really began when I was 13, and a close family friend who was like an uncle to me actually passed away from pancreatic cancer. And when the disease hit so close to home, I really knew that I needed to learn more. So I went online to find answers. And using Google and Wikipedia, I found a variety of statistics on pancreatic cancer. And what I had found really shocked me. Over 85% of all pancreatic cancers are diagnosed late, when someone has less than a 2% chance of survival. I was thinking, why are we so bad at detecting pancreatic cancer? The reason our current modern medicine is a 60-year-old technique, I mean, that's older than my dad, but also it costs $800 per test and is grossly inaccurate, missing 30% of all pancreatic cancers. Your doctor would have to be ridiculously suspicious that you have the cancer in order to give you this test. And so armed with ninth grade freshman biology, I decided to set out to change cancer diagnostics. Bit lofty of a goal, however, I then went back online and I found what a sensor for pancreatic cancer would really have to look like. It had to be sensitive, uh, inexpensive, rapid, simple, and all of those criteria, minimally invasive. And I was pretty sure I could do this, but I wasn't quite sure how. And after tons and tons of research, I finally stumbled upon this one article that was a list of 8,000 different proteins that are found in your bloodstream when you have these different cancers. And since it was summer break, I had nothing else to do. So I kind of shut myself in my room and just went through all 8,000. And on the 4,000th try, I finally found one called mesothelone. And mesothelone is just your ordinary run-of-the-mill type protein, unless you have pancreatic, ovarian, and lung cancer, in which case it's highly overexpressed in the patient's serum. But also, it's found in the very earliest stages of the disease, sometimes in the precursor lesions, when a patient has close to 100% chance of survival. So now that I found a protein that could reliably signify the presence of the cancer, I then shifted my focus to actually detecting that protein and thus the cancer. And I kind of had my epiphany moment in the most unlikely of places, high school biology class, absolute stifler of innovation, particularly with my high school biology teacher. I mean, I did not like her. So <laughs> I'd snuck in this article on what are called single-walled carbon nanotubes, long, thin pipes of carbon that are an atom thick and one fifty thousandth of the diameter of your hair. And they have these really amazing properties. They're kind of like the superheroes of material science. So I was just reading about these, and we were learning about antibodies. I was kind of being droned to sleep by my biology teacher. And all of a sudden, it hit me. Essentially, you can take these antibodies and weave it into this network of nanotubes, such that you have a network that only reacts with one specific protein. But also, what will happen is when you put a blood sample on this matrix, essentially, the protein, the mesothelin, will go into this network and form an immunocomplex with the protein and spread neighboring nanotubes apart, and that will cause a change in electrical resistance. And so then, just as I had this kind of epiphany moment, my biology teacher storms up to me and snatches away this article, and I kind of felt like she was saying, what is this actual science doing in my science class? <laughs> However, after a 30-minute lecture, I finally got on to actually doing some more research, and I found that these networks of nanotubes are extremely flimsy, and since they're so delicate, they need to be supported. So I chose to use paper. Making a paper sensor for pancreatic cancer is about as simple as making chocolate chip cookies, which I love. I mean, if I get a B on the test, there goes the chocolate chip cookies plus some ice cream. And so essentially, you start with some water, you pour in the dispersant for the single-walled carbon nanotubes, you then add in the antibody, you then mix it up, you vortex it, take some paper, dip it, dry it, and then you can detect cancer. And 
then I realized I'm going to need a lab for this. I mean, I can't have the Andreka Household Cancer Research Program. Me and my brother had done some pretty crazy stuff. We have this big vat of uranium in our basement next to some nitroglycerin. And we're even on the FBI watch list. However, my mom didn't have it in the budget for cancer research. So I emailed 200 different professors at Johns Hopkins University and the National Institutes of Health essentially asking, hey, can I work in your lab? And it was accompanied by this 32-page behemoth of a document outlining procedure, timeline, all of that. And then I sat back waiting for all these positive emails to pour in, waiting to pick and choose a lab. And then reality took hold. I got 199 rejections. And finally, one professor, Dr. Anirbhai Maitra of Johns Hopkins University, finally told me, yes, you can come into my lab. After an hour-long interrogation, I finally got through that, and I got to start in the lab. I realized I had no clue what I was doing in that. I mean, first day, culture some cancer cells, pretty basic stuff. I sneezed in them, I had a bit of a cold, and it's like, maybe they have an immune system, it'll work out, right? And eventually, after seven months of screwing every possible procedure up in the lab, I finally ended up with one small paper sensor that costs three cents and takes five minutes to run. This makes it 168 times faster, over 26,000 times less expensive, and over 400 times more sensitive than our current methods of detection. But also, in patient studies, so far it's 100% accurate, well, close to 100% accurate. It's actually like 97.5 or something. But also can detect the cancer in the earliest stages, when someone has close to 100% chance of survival. So in the next two to five years, this patent-pending sensor could potentially lift the once dismal pancreatic cancer survival rates from 5.5% close to 100%, and would do similar for ovarian and lung cancer. But this paper sensor actually is a very versatile platform. You can essentially switch out that antibody and detect an entirely different disease, range from Alzheimer's to other forms of cancer, even HIV AIDS and heart disease. And through this, I learned a really important lesson, that through the internet, anything is possible. Theories can be shared, and you can be a kid like me, you can be 15, you don't have to have MD or PhD behind your name in order to have your ideas valued. And so my hope for the future is that everyone in the world will be able to share their ideas on the internet and we can all work together to make the world a better place. Thank you.